So all this pile of networking gear here is actually going somewhere. So uh, while it's going somewhere, we uh, decided to do a video before it all gets deployed. So I'm gonna do kind of an in-depth video on the Unify. But I thought, why not take it another step further and build it all out and mount it. Plug and, all the uh, things in. Yeah, plug all the things in. We'll show you how it mounts, how it works, and kind of give you a detailed overview. So once I get this mounted, I'll show you kind of uh, what it looks like physically. Then I'll do a little network map of how we're going to do this. And then I'll show you how we deploy a Unify network. So I'm going to do this in a way that gives you an idea of what it looks like installed. But then we're going to get into the software details. But I've done reviews in detail on these switches specifically. This is what they look like mounted. Uh, we didn't put all the screws in it, so someone points out that I missed a screw. I know, these are temporarily sitting in our studio here. Anyway, so we can get that out of the way. Uh, this is a feed line from my lab that's gonna feed the internet to our USG. That's the head end of the system is gonna be the USG. After the USG, we got the 24 port switch. So we come out of the LAN port on the USG, go to port one on the 24 port switch. And we're gonna cover this with a whole schematic when we're done, when we actually see how the software is set up. Then out of here, we got port 24, we got this red wire and we fished it down here and it comes back up here. I would have loved to use the SFP ports on these. I just don't happen to have any handy right now. So uh, we're out of port 24 and into port 48. These other two lines that you see were one here and one here go to power bricks on the back. And these power bricks on the back power these two unifies. So we have an slightly older, this is your standard APLR. Unify, and then this is the APACLR right here. This is the newer APAC model. This is the older one. Uh, we plug both these in. And this is all part of our demo when we show you how we hook all these up. I mean, ideally, these things would be installed at different points in an office, uh, but we're doing this all in my lab and my studio here, but I just wanted to mount it all. It's also keeping it off the table while I do all this testing because there's some other stuff on the table uh, going on, so I figured to put it all up here. And we have this uh, APC rack uh, that we had laying around, so I mounted that up here. But it kind of gave me an idea of what it looks like mounted up. I mean, normally we'd have a bunch of stuff in this 48 port. I'm not gonna run and punch a bunch of wires for the demo. Uh, but I think a few of you asked, and maybe we're gonna do some videos like in our lab to kind of walk you through how you set up a patch panel. You normally you have a lot of patching in between here. I'm just gonna plug a handful of devices in around the office for uh, some of the demo purposes as we dig into how the software works. Now, all these are factory reset fresh with the latest firmware. So the next thing we do is start with how we load the Unify software and then go from how to load the Unify software to set up the USG, to set up the 24, uh, the 48, and then the subsequent Unify uh, wireless and how we set all this up. And we'll go over how the VLANs get set up and how the separate networks get set up. So uh, now that we've looked at this whole rack here where it'll sit, uh, let's jump into the software side of this and show you how to actually all the configuration works. Okay, everything's plugged in, everything's hooked up. And because I wanted to do this review as a full top to bottom review, the first thing we're gonna do is install the Unify software. So the default IP address of the USG, which is the head end of this network is 192.168.11. You can go to it, but you can't really do much other than get it online. And it wants you to install the Unify controller software to manage the gateway. It links here, and we're going to be loading version 5.6.22. My preferred way to do this is in a small virtual machine on the same network. It has to be on the inside, same network as your setting network on for setup purposes and for the purposes of this video. Yes, you can use external controllers. Yes, there's other ways to manage it. Now, you have separate videos on that. You can find it in my Unify list. Uh, but this is specifically setting up a top-to-bottom network and you're controlling it. Let's say you're the only one network, not a multi-hosted system externally. So we have the uh, Debian controller. It is version 5.6.2.2, so it's the latest version of the software. I've already got it here. Now, something interesting, whenever you uh, download the software, clear this real quick, it always calls it unify underscore sys v init underscore all dot deb when you're downloading it, no matter what version it is. Uh, so just a little side note, when you, it will tell you what version one is installing, but it will, when you download it, always call it the same file name. So let's run the installer real quick. I'm logged in as root. And I've done a video on how to install this, but I'll still walk you through it unpacking and it should give me an error.
and it did. Now, it's just telling you that there's a few things and dependencies and that it needs. This is my reason for loving Debian, and I switched to it like 17 years ago because I can do this, apt get install dash F. It's going to find those dependencies. Yep, I'm just going to press enter. Whoops, I need to add DNS to this. My bad. Let me fix that real quick. I uh, booted this up. It did not. This is actually the config didn't have a DNS setting, so I just got to add that into this particular machine. One second. App git install dash f just says find all those dependencies and loads all the extra things needed to get the Unify system up and running. And after a few seconds here with this small VM, it'll be up and running. Now, it doesn't take a lot of power to run the Unify controller software. This VM has a uh, gig of RAM dedicated to it and like a single processor. It's very low powered. I think I've seen some people even come up with ways you can run this on like a Raspberry Pi. That might be a little bit slow, so you want something moderately fast. We're going to play with some of the more advanced stuff in here, but it really is not much of a processor hog. It's a, it's a pretty small system here. Okay, we have the machine up and running. Like I said, it's barely using anything we're about to go through the setup. Uh, it runs in its own Java VM, and it's using all of about 500 out of the gigaram I have assigned to this uh, virtual machine. So it's, like I said, not real and intensive processor-wise. All right, let's jump over and start logging in. Now, no matter what you install the Unify on, the IP address you want to go to is whatever the IP address of the server is you loaded on, colon H443, but don't forget to start with the HTTPS. So here we are, first time logging in. Going to get the error from the self-signed certificate, and we're going to run through the wizard. Now it finds all the devices that we have plugged into the network and wants us to say, hey, do you want to adopt these in? We're actually going to go ahead and skip this and we'll adopt them once we get into the system itself. We'll skip the Wi-Fi setup as well. We'll do that all inside the system. Now I use a so-so password uh, that was easy. Oh, I guess it won't let me even do a so-so password. That's actually a nice feature. I didn't know they added this. We mostly have been upgrading our in-place installation, and I use LastPass, but apparently with this, it uh, won't let me just use a bad password, so I'll come up with something a little better. There we go. Finish. And it should bring me to the login page. I'm not. We're not going to do the cloud access. I may do a separate video on the cloud access, but I don't really use it. What it does is allows you to tie into their cloud systems. I like to keep everything self-contained and self-hosted, which is one of the reasons I really like the Unify software. You can host your own cloud controller and server, which is exactly what we do. All right, logged in with the good password I had. And it's not going to have much in here because now we get to start adopting devices. Now I'm not going to save that. Devices. Now... There's some firmware updates, which is cool. So we have some firmware we can load on here. We have found in the past, most of these can be updated to new firmware without doing the adoption process. But I go ahead and adopt them first unless there's a problem. Uh, as we've actually run into with the USG where it does not like to do an upgrade not adopted. Uh, but it's not a big deal. We're just going to start adopting them and setting up the network in here. So first things first. Let's get this done. Now, something I'm going to change in here, you can change your preferences, and I'm going to add a feature, uh, enable the refresh button, save and close, and this refreshes by itself on its own timer, but this is how you can actually, f say, update this page now. There's not always a need for it, but if you want to know if it's only refreshing every two minutes and it's done, you have to wait another two minutes for it shows something on here, you just go here, and you can set preferences on a per-account basis. So right now it's going through the provisioning mode. So we'll refresh it again. All right, it has been adopted. Now we're gonna go ahead and adopt all the other devices and then we'll start rolling through the upgrades. Adopt, adopt, adopt. And whoop, adopt. So now it's adopting and provisioning all of those. Now you may have noticed down here, to 
my wired connection deactivated. Uh, when it provisions these, which is also why I don't want to do the upgrades, you want to stage the upgrades based on this. When it's provisioning, it restarts each of the switches. The 24 port switch and the 48 port switch are going to get restarted, and that's what I'm plugged into. So obviously I don't want to be pushing firmware to devices connecting to them while those are getting provisioned and restarted. So now this one's connected and provisioned. This one should come next, and then these should be provisioned. Now when I do the firmware upgrades, I'm going to start with the connected devices then do the switches last. You just got to think about the order you're doing. You don't want to push all the firmware at the same time because it's smart and it should stop it from doing something stupid, but just in case anything's overlooked, why chance uh, firmware, you know, running into an error with that. So now I'm going to run through the upgrades. We're going to start with the peripheral devices. I'm going to update this and then this particular APC ALR needs an upgrade. And then lastly, I'll do the switches. All right, now I have all the units adopted, and I realized I made a mistake, and I'll actually cover it in videos. When you first seen me adopting them, you've seen them all require them upgrade, and I wanted to upgrade them, and they wouldn't upgrade. Uh, that was completely my mistake because I had statically assigned the name server when I loaded the Debian virtual machine. So when I loaded it, it was on one network, and when I moved over to this network, it was looking for the wrong name server. And it turns out, because it didn't have the right name server, when you logged into it, it couldn't go to the internet and make sure each of these had the latest firmware. So just by putting in the right DNS server, they all have the new firmwares. I thought they did. And now it actually has the option, except for this one, Wi-Fi Unit 1 does need an upgrade. So I'm going to go ahead and upgrade this one. And we'll go ahead and hit Confirm, and it'll provision the upgrade on there. So we have everything adopted, everything is up to date, all the latest firmware versions, and the network is fully connected. But we haven't set up anything else. So let's start diving into the Unify software and kind of walk you through how it works. Now this is the latest version as of December 1st, which is 5.622. We were on the device manager, which is where we adopt and get everything set up. And now we're gonna jump over here to the dashboard. So here's how it looks from the dashboard. We have uh, one active WAN here, LAN device, WAN device. And what we're actually seeing is the layout of the network is how this is too. So here's another LAN device. Here's the one in here. And let me just jump over to the map and show you how that works. This is the mapping function. Now the map's interesting because this is the default image that they throw in here. And what we can do is drag where they are in your office and say, all right, we have this switch. Uh, this Maybe this is a room. There we go. Maybe we have another switch in this room over here. And we have one of the Wi-Fi's. Uh, we'll put it in this little conference room. Put another one over here. And we'll say that this one's in this room here. Now, this is kind of neat because what they're letting you do is map out where things are physically. This is a default image, but you can add a new map and edit the map and upload different images for different floors and zoom in and out and lay out all your devices in reference to where things are. So you up, you have a drawing of your building, you can upload it on there and it will then, you know, overlay these. This makes it really easy. We've done this with, like I said, a lot of deployments in schools. And if we have a schematic of the school, we can put it on there and we can drag all of them. And the nice thing is the controls to can do things on these is actually going to be right here to get statistics, to get information on them and how it's set up. Topology. This is so cool that it does this. Uh, it says, okay, internet comes in from the USG here and I can move these around. It goes into the 24 port switch. Here's the one Wi-Fi unit plugged in a 24 port switch like we showed you at the beginning. Then the 24 port switch goes into the 48 port switch, and then we have another Wi-Fi unit plugged in. This system will actually show you all the devices as they get connected like this. It's really rather clever. Right now I click on 2G coverage, 5G coverage, there's nothing here. And we're gonna jump real quick and just add a network to this to show how that works. So we're gonna go over here to settings wireless networks. And so far I've left everything at default. These are still out of the box things. Everything is very customizable in here. All right, now we can create a new wireless network and we'll call this one Studio Network One. And we're gonna go ahead and set it to WP Personal, Security Key. We can set it to wherever we want. And nice thing is you can click here. I just set it to be password one, two, three for this demo. And we're going to leave everything in default. But you do have advanced options, and we'll get into that in a second here. So we'll hit Save. And now we're going to jump over to Devices to show you what's going on. 
these have now switched into provisioning mode. It only takes a second. And what they're doing is they're provisioning out these settings. So these are in provisioning. You notice how there's no options to click on anything. All right, so now that we're back over here at Maps, I refresh the page, and you can see here's my 5G coverage, because only this one's 5G, this one's not. Here's our 2G coverage. Now, granted, it's making estimations based on sizes you put into the building to try to determine the coverage. And of course, with any Wi-Fi, we can't determine what's in the walls and what the penetration level will be. Whenever we do Wi-Fi testing, we literally bring these units on site, set them in the offices where we plan to use them, and see how far the reach is. Uh, that's a separate video for Wi-Fi deployments, but there's no magic sauce that will determine the exact construction of a building and absolutely give me a clear picture without taking a Wi-Fi unit there to just how far the reach is. So these are best guess estimates. Now, granted, if you are doing the estimates in an open area, an open field, you obviously get a lot better coverage and you can kind of guesstimate those, but how often are you deploying Wi-Fi in an open field? Not that often. Usually you're dealing with buildings and everything else. But what this does is gives you kind of like a heat map to where the coverage should be estimated to be, and you can change and adjust the receiver sensitivity over here. This is the physical map, though, for how we can take a look at things and look at the devices. Let's jump over to the other type of map that's in here, which is a topology map. And while we showed that you can see the linking between the devices, this is a visualization for the linking between devices. So right here is the Wi-Fi there, Wi-Fi there, and then we can also hit Show Clients. So there's the Unify controller, the virtual box. There's my laptop and how it's connected. Currently, we have nothing connected through here and here. And the nice thing is if I move my laptop and I plug this in to this switch, Within about a minute or two, it will re-update and show my client going that way. Also, by clicking these, you can expand and contract things. Now, I'm going to go ahead and connect my phone to this unit right here. All right, so now I connected my phone. So here's my phone, and it just has an ID there. Now, if we go over here to the clients... Here it is, Studio Network 1, and how it's connected. Overview of it, statistics, packet inspection, with nothing's available yet. But you get the idea that each of the devices plugged in. Whoops, go to the map here again. Change it to topology, and you can see how the clients connect. Now, like I said, this updates about every two minutes, and you can get insights into each device connecting. Now, that's really nice because if you're trying to trace out problems, it lets you go there. And when you double-click on any of these devices, and we'll go over here, for example. Let me close these real quick so you can see what pops open. So we'll click on the Unify controller here. It brings up these property dialog boxes, and we can pop them out just like we did with the switches. And you can also name them if you want. So you can get statistics on them, what they're doing, where they're going, information, history of when they connected, if it has any of that information. And then you can give them an alias so you can understand where they are or even create groups that they belong to. And this is where you can assign a fixed IP address. Now, because of the way the Unify software works, it's kind of nice but maybe a little bit different because you're used to going to everything to a series of tables they have this design concept because you everything through here that okay i want to assign a fixed ip address 249 is what i want to assign to this save now i've statically assigned that device to that address so it's almost a little bit confusing how it works but it's also a little bit more intuitive if you're you know, if you're used to doing networks, it's hard. If you're not used to it, you're like, oh, I just click on it and assign it an address and hit save, right? It's it's a little bit different how some of the network works, but it's also really convenient once you're used to it and it makes managing things, you know, really great. And while we're here, we'll name this. This is actually my laptop. Tom's laptop. Notes if you want to put them in there. Tom's ThinkPad, save. Close. Refresh this. I think it should actually change it in here as well. I have, I think, to jump to another page. It takes a second because it's probably provisioning some of the information. There we go. Now it's refreshed. And we can see Tom's laptop right here. 
Now, we'll go a step further because it says 24-port switch in rack number 4. What this is actually telling us, and you can see which on the rack, I'm plugged into port 4. So I can actually then go and name port 4 as well. Tom's laptop. Apply. Yeah, I'm updating the same port the controller's in. Because it realizes the controller's in this port, it does give you a warning, which I think is really smart. Because if you were about to block this port, for example, because one of the other options we're going to get into here is how you can change VLANs and ports. If I were to block this port, I would have a real big problem because I would be blocking the port that the Unify controller itself is plugged in. You don't get that message on any other port, but only if Unify senses that this would, what your changes could possibly disrupt it. Not that the change I did was disrupting, but when you're making a change to a port, for example, turning the port off, that would actually be the last thing you did, and you'd have to plug into a different port to get back on the network. Uh, so you don't want to do that, especially because we manage a lot of these remotely. I like these little warnings, so they make me go, huh, hold on, before I change this, let me make sure and double check all the settings because you can't switch it back because it's the controlling port. So kind of that's kind of the rough overview of how things are connected. Let's get a little deeper and show you into the settings. So we already seen the Wi-Fi up here. So we're going to start with, this is the wireless network, and this is where we created one, and we'll get into creating more of them, but we've got to do a few other things first. I haven't had any problems doing it, but there is a warning because it's some, some of the stuff's in beta, like the speed tests and some of the port remapping features. And what this actually lets you do, for example, like there's three ports on the USG. This allow you to take a port labeled as VoIP and turn it into like a second WAN port, for example. And this actually would also allow you to have some of the uh, automatic uplink failovers. And what this is a really weird but neat feature. If you have a device, a wireless device, that gets broken off from the network, but it's within range of another Wi-Fi device that it is on the network, which means it got disconnected from the network, but it's still powered on. And, of course, if they're PoE, uh, that doesn't usually happen, but it can. It can then identify, diagnose, and then set to a bridge mode across the antennas to keep extending the Wi-Fi network without a physical network connection. It's kind of like a mesh system. It's kind of clever that they built these in. I, I find it really interesting. I don't really, I haven't really used the feature. I do like it though that it monitors them. And what happens is, and actually I'll show you this as a test, it tells you that they're in working, that the unit's still working, but it's in isolated mode. And we'll, we'll simulate that failure here uh, during this tutorial. So here's all the, if you want to enable SSH, you can set an admin and password for that. I believe the password default is the password I just set for the system. And anytime I change anything here, I have to click apply and then it provisions out to this particular USG. Let me close this on the side. It's not relevant. Jump back over to the wireless networks. Now I deployed a wireless network, and it seamlessly deploys it across as many devices as I have connected. So we have two of them here for this demo, but if I add another network setting, I can force it to only be on one or the other, but the default is to create a seamless network across all of your sites. So we called this Studio Network 1, and we're going to go ahead and create a new wireless network and cleverly name it Studio 2. Set a password for it. Now, here's where the advanced options come in. We've got more fine control, like if you want to put this on its own VLAN, uh, enable fast roaming. Some of the devices, this helps uh, enable like the handoffs between devices when you're wandering around. It'll jump over them. You can, by default, it's AES, CMP, WP2. You can control, and if you had to, Unfortunately, we have a client, even though it's broken, um, they have to run things in TKIP because of the old devices they have on a network. So we created a separate network just for those devices to be on. Uh, it's a it's all we can do because they can't afford to buy the devices that are on this because it's a big industrial controller. But you can also roll back to WP1, but by default, good news, that's disabled. You can also prevent the SSID from being broadcast here. Uh, these are where you can start applying groups to it. I haven't really tested the power saving, but uh, the schedule is really clever because you can schedule what time you want your Wi-Fi to turn on and off. We actually did our store. Uh, when we're not here, we just have the Wi-Fi. We have multiple networks, but we have one of the networks that's generally our customer side network LAN. We just have that turn off. And uh, 
keeps things se separated and no one even knows the Wi-Fi is there once you're <laughs> once uh, it's after hours. Then you have all kinds of rate and beacon controls, uh, whitelist, blacklist, Mac filtering, so you can create Mac filters and say only this type of filtering. And that's on a per network, not a per device. So as I create each network, I can create a Mac filtered network if I want more security where I only allow these Mac addresses on. Yes, I know you can spoof a Mac address, but it adds another layer of trouble it is to jump on that network so you can keep it very filtered. It also has radius authentication support so you can use radius authentication to determine what is going to get on there um, with, with an extra level of security. Now let's look at the networks themselves. So we're gonna create a new network is here, but we're gonna go back. I'm just gonna go back and edit the existing one we have. So LAN, corporate, you want it to be a guest. And you can't really choose these other options, VLAN only, remote user, site to site. You have to do all that within the next ones. It needs a primary LAN, and this is where you're gonna set the settings, and this will cascade all the settings across. Now. I've uh, had it assigned the manual, this ni the 999 server. You can leave it to auto. Um, for testing, I was putting it in here, but you just took this to auto. It'll act as a DNS forwarder. Uh, you can set the domain name, whether or not you want IGMP snooping on. It does support DHCP relay as a beta feature, but I thought that's kind of nice that it had it in there. I've had, uh, not often, but I have run into times when we need that. If you want to enable UPnP on the LAN, you can do that. Not usually in a corporate environment, but if you happen to be using a USG at home, uh, if you're running gaming systems, especially like the Xbox or the Playstations, their popular need is having that on there. Then set your lease times and you know whether or not you want things just to be as they are. So let's go back over the networks. And let's create a second network. Cancel. Create new network. Some guess will be what we'll call the network. And there's one physical port, so we're actually going to go ahead and give this a VLAN ID of 10. And when you type this in, it'll let me automatically update to DHCP range and just follow the suit here. And I'm going to customize it 100 to 200. And what I did here was VLAN ID 10, so it's going to have physically the same interface. 192.168.10.1 would be the IP address. It's a slash 24 network. You just type it in, uh, put the notation in there. We'll call it guess as the domain. And I'm going to leave everything else uh, as is. Hit save. VLAN ID 10. And we should go back over here to devices. And it's provisioning it out right now. And now it provisions it out to all the other devices that need to have provisioning. All right, so everything's provisioned, and we have that second network we created on VLAN 10. Now let's talk about actually how we push that across the network. So let's go over here and look at the clients, because I plugged another laptop in. And it's called, the name of the system happens to be Equal Top. And it's 48 port switch studio rack number six. Now let's just jump over here to map real quick. And I was going to show you that the way the clients look. Topology. So it comes from USG, goes on the 24, goes here. So this is where it is. And we can get statistics, what it's doing, configuration. Network. And... Jump over here to clients, and we can see the IP address, 192.168.106. It's still on the dot one network, and we want to get this over on the dot 10 network. So we're going to go click on the switch here, and it brings us, because I clicked on it here, right to the port that this is in. So we're going to go here, and it's actually Steve's laptop I took. Steve's laptop, and we want this to be on some guest, 10. And what this let me know gives me a warning. It's going to be overriding any of the customizations I had to this. And I covered this in the full switch review, but just real quick, you can edit any individual port to 
function differently. A mirroring port, an aggregate port, manual link. Uh, you can go into and you know get all the details set up for each of these ports. But we're taking this, and we don't care about the profile overrides. We want that port to be belong to the sum guest VLAN 10 that we created. Now, all we had to do is create that in the network. It, this option to change any port to belong to a VLAN is universally everywhere. It's all the switches. If we had 20 switches, it gets deployed. That's what the provisioning was when you change a network, is pushing all these configuration settings. So when I want to create a new VLAN, I go ahead and create the VLAN, and all of my network that's on this network, all the devices on this network, get that VLAN information. Now, obviously, it's tedious to edit individual ports one at a time, but yes, in case you're wondering, you can select multiple ports like this and select them and edit groups of ports at a time like this and assign those groups of ports to a particular setting. So that is that is an option just so you know if you don't want to go through tediously doing it, especially if you have like 20 or 48 port units, you're like, okay, these group this way, these group that way. You notice how when I selected these, it lets you select group supports. That is an option when you're doing it, uh, but we set that one. So now that laptop, I may have to refresh the IP address on it. All right, just took a second to refresh here in our network. So now we can see Equaltop is on the 192.168.10 network. The connection is the sum guest. So instead of Studio One network or just our standard LAN, it gives the VLAN name. Pretty straightforward to follow. And now I can move anyone I want. Now this also applies to wireless. So let's go back over here and look at our topology again. And so we still see the same connectivity physically where he's at. So he's going from equal top to the 48 port switch to the 24 port switch to the USG. But when we double click it, we can see that it's on the some guest network. So we can still, it picked up the name of it and we can still rename it and call it something else, a different friendly name, whichever we want to group, uh, name it to for convenience and follow that device. Now, please note because the naming is tied to the MAC address, whenever it moves to another port, it will move the name as well. So if I move my computer to a different port, it'll move over and my name, because it's named based on MAC address, will follow suit. And that took about less than a minute uh, from when I moved to maybe almost two minutes. Uh, I unplugged it, mine from the 24, plugged it into the 48 port switch, and you can see where my system now moved over. I kind of like the animation for when things are moving over. Uh, as you get a larger network, it's crazy how this looks because uh, you can drill down a lot. That's also why you have the uh, show clients and not show clients on there. Now we also have the ability to have link labels on here. So when I add the link labels, it gets that much more interesting. It's equal top, port number six into the 48, Tom, and the Unify controller, because it's actually running on my laptop in a virtual machine, are both plugged into port 32. So it very cleverly lets you know which network that the device is connected to and how it's connected. So it then lets you know that this goes from 48 to 24, and then this goes into 1 and goes here. Now let's take a look at the switches real quick and start looking a little bit in the details of how those uh, switches appear. The switches are smart, and they know which ports are for what. So it realizes, and it's kind of small, but it's got a little up arrow. This is the uplink port. So it knows that this is where the port is uplinked to the other switch. And then the green ones represent other devices we plugged in. And the orange just means things connected, but because that Wi-Fi unit's older, it only links at 100. So that's the label right here. That's the 100 meg versus a gigabit connection. Let's take a look at the 24 port switch. Same thing, different though, because it realizes that the uplink ports here to the USG and now this is kind of neat. It doesn't give a symbol for the downlink port, but it has it here. It lets you know the uplink and downlink for it. Now, 
So right here is the downlink to the 48-port switch. It knows that's the next device in the network. So you can look at it from a non-graphical version by opening up each switch and determining this. But I am just really love the way it maps things out for you as all the devices get plugged in because if you're trying to trace things out on a network, that becomes a really handy thing to do. So let's go back over to the network settings again down here at the gears. Wireless networks. Studio Network 1. Let's go ahead and create one. Call it Studio Network 2. We didn't hit save last time. That's why it wasn't there from before. Advanced options. We're going to use a VLAN, and we're going to put this one on that VLAN 10 that we created. Save. Now we have two separate networks, and this one's on VLAN 10. Go over here, devices, and you'll see the Wi-Fi units provisioning. And they provision really fast. Now there is a slight disruption every time you provision a Wi-Fi unit because it adds a setting, so the Wi-Fi units do drop and disconnect briefly. All right, so my phone's reconnected. I realized I called it Studio Network. Not, I forgot the K in network, but it's on VLAN 10, and it's getting the .10 address, which is the network we assigned for that particular VLAN. So we jump back over here to the map again. And there it is connected. Studio Network 2. And that's what's kind of clever is it shows which Wi-Fi network you're connected to. So you have each one. And now we see on this one. Now let's talk about the failure mode I wanted to show you kind of an interesting demo of. So this unit right here is connected. This is Wi-Fi Unit 1. And here's Wi-Fi Unit 2. And this is this is a feature of the newer uh, Wi-Fi units. I mean, I don't know that all the, the early models are supported in this particular feature. And what it did is it realizes that this is isolated right now. And what that means is it's on, but not connected to the network. It's disconnected. So it was plugged into right here. But then it's unplugged because it, I physically reached over and unplugged it. So by doing that, it just goes into an isolated mode because the other Wi-Fi units can see it, but it can't see the network. So this is a really helpful diagnostic tool because there's disconnected as in you don't see it and it'll give you an error for that until you missed heartbeat and it says, you know, device is offline. But this one, it realizes the device is on the network in terms of power, but not on the network in terms of connectivity. So it sees it's broadcasting, but it's not actually connected to the network. Now, this is where it gets another step of cool to me is if you wanted to bridge this and create like the mesh network, you can actually uh, have the units talk to each other and then create a uplink between them by selecting this. And now it's going to attempt to create the bridge for you. So this device will still work kind of like a repeater mode. I've actually done very little testing with this because generally I'm not the biggest fan of mesh networks. I've worked with them a few times and we've been called in to replace them because I've never seen one that works as seamlessly as I think it should. And generally hardline to each one is just way faster and less prone to problems. Especially because most of these networks that we put in have a lot of users. So handing things off from mesh to mesh becomes kind of tricky. It says not a valid target. I have a feeling it doesn't want to work because it's the uh, two different models. I'll have to try this sometime as a separate video with uh, two new models. I just don't happen to have any in stock right now. So I'm going to plug this Wi-Fi back in, and we'll get to some more settings. The nice thing is it's pretty fast from the time I plug it in till going back to connected and back up and running. Now... A couple side notes here. As I had said, you can custom config each one. This is where you can override what the radios are doing and which WLANs are on here. So by default, it gets each one of these. I can edit and override so this particular one does not get a particular Wi-Fi setting. I usually don't have a lot of use cases particularly for that, but definitely an option if I wanted to where I can customize each one. Generally, when we put these in, we assign a couple different networks, maybe a couple different VLANs to them, and disperse them throughout the companies or the areas we're putting them in, and we want them all to be on the same network. So generally, that's the deployment, but you can override that configuration and change things around. 
All right, so let's go back into the network settings here. I will cover a couple things that I'm not going to do in depth today, uh, but this does have the option if you've seen it in there. And I'm going to do separate videos because I'm just not real adept at the VPNs. I've not actually done, I've had a few friends who have, but I have not done anything with the VPNs on here for remote user VPN. I was told it's pretty straightforward on these. I'm going to do a separate video on how to handle VPNs. It does have a remote VPN, site-to-site -site VPN, or acting as a client. I've been told it's uh, fairly straightforward to do, but I have not actually tested it. So I am uh, i can't comment on that at all at this moment. Any of the deployments we have for VPN, as you may know if you watch my channel at all, I'm a huge fan of PFSense, and that's where I always deploy my VPNs. Uh, we put these in some clients' networks that don't need VPN. Uh, we primarily use these in small business networks where VPNs rarely even something they're talking about. They mostly just need connectivity and uh, a nice interface for us to manage things. So I'll close this one. Now, we'll get to the next part of networking because this is something we do a lot of. Creating firewall rules and port forwarding. This was confusing. If you look at my previous USG video, I think someone had commented that it didn't have a lot of features. That video is also old. The nice thing about the way Unify works, they get the product out there and they kind of listen to people, which is rare for a technology company, and they look at what features we're looking for and start adding them in. In the latest version of the Unify software, I believe it's the first time they moved it to here, they moved all the port forwarding rules to a place that makes more sense to me. It was a little different the way you did it before. Now it's nice because we can just go create port forwarding rule and we're gonna have a pretend camera. Well, we'll put camera system from anyone, port number 7443. If you didn't know, that's the uh, one for there. That's the one for the Unify cameras. Forward to IP, 192.168. We'll say 1.10. We're making it up because it doesn't exist. 7443. TCP, UDP, and whether or not you want logging turned on. Save. And if we go over here to devices, you can see it's provisioning that port forward to the USG. And the provisioning happens fairly fast. And as you can see, we jumped over here and it provisions fairly fast when you make a network change like that. It doesn't take long at all. It doesn't disrupt the system while it's doing it. It added the port forwarding rules. They're added. So back over here to the rules. port forwarding and you're done now if you wanted to create a restriction and we'll edit this rule real quick again to say limited and only allow from a certain ip address that's easily achieved in here this makes so much more sense and i you don't recall exactly but i remember being a lot more complicated the way they had it before and kind of buried in some menus this is a really simple port forwarding uh, system. It's not as advanced as some of the other firewalls, but it gets the basics done. So a lot of times that's all we have to do. The most common deployment we see is maybe a camera system or a couple little things in there. Now, the only thing I'm not as clear about is will it let me forward to the other network or will it ask me questions and does it do that automatically? So let's test this real quick. If I hit 10.10 .10 anywhere. Okay, let me do that. Now let's try this. If we put it in the dot twenty network, it should give me an error saying that network doesn't exist. It does not. So I wish it was a little bit more, a little bit smarter, and would actually allow me to forward something to a specific network and actually ask, ask me what that network was. But it doesn't appear to care. It'll let me type in whatever I want for the forwarded IP. Save. Now, if you want to see if the rule actually works, we're going to do a quick test here, something simple. So I'll create a test rule, and we'll create a port number 12345. Put in the IP address of 192.168.1.66. Happens to be my laptop's address. And hit Save. So there's a rule we're going to provision to my laptop, which is the .66. Now, a couple side notes, though. You notice I gave my laptop a friendly name. Those friendly names don't work or show up when you're doing port forwarding rules. It would be kind of nice if they would. So if you would name the devices, it would be nice if they showed up here. So if Unify is listening or watching my video, maybe this is something that they'll do. But it does not autocomplete, so you don't have that really as an option in there. So that's provisioned. 
Let's look at the devices. And we need our WAN address here. So we're going to go over here to our USG, expand out the WAN address, and we see it's uh, 172.116.9.102. And like I said, this is not really a WAN address. Anyone knows that's actually in a private range. We're going to do host name that, 12345 as the port. And we, this is part of my lab, so it's going to be the, I call it, VLAN 69 lab. It's a VLAN I have just for doing this. We're going to go over to my system. We're going to do a netcat dash L for listen. 192.168.1.66, my IP address, 12345 port. And you see I've tested this before. I said it hit up arrow. Test. And test port was successful. We look back over here. And when it sends the command, it actually closes it so we can see that Netcat is done listening. So definitely it works. It easy way to test it real quick and kind of get an idea. But obviously it doesn't care if I put in a different IP address. It doesn't give me a warning. I'm sure it cares and it won't go to the right address. Uh, but that is kind of an interesting thing about the way the, the port forwarding works. Let's back over your settings and let's talk about the firewall. So the firewall itself has a couple of its own rules to accept and drop and you can create each one of the rule sets WAN out, WAN in, LAN in, LAN out, LAN local, guest in, guest out, and guest local. So if we go to WAN in and here is the rules auto created for the camera and the test rule. So we can't actually edit those, but we can create new rules. And this is a nice thing about the port forwarding is that it does allow for automatic rule creation of firewalls. So I only had to create it once under port forwarding and it automatically creates a matching firewall rule to allow the traffic. But if you wanted to do everything more in a manual way, you can go through here and do more detailed work for distant destinations, as your address group destinations, different types of filtering, drop, accept, reject. And another thing is kind of neat, you have over here more detailed tuning of like state timeouts, protocol options, if it's SIP, uh, whether or not you want ping or receive redirects or send redirects or send. You can, they have some decent firewall rules in here. Now, I have not messed with much with it, but if I understand correctly, because these are all built on a custom Linux kernel, you can get in there and start manually writing and manually editing firewall rules so you can go beyond what the interface here will let you do. Goes beyond the scope of this talk here and this tutorial, but to give you an idea, definitely if you have those advanced skills and you want to do it, yes, you can override what's in here by logging in directly to the unit itself. So I kind of just get over there, and this of course is where you can just add some static routes. This is the final thing in the routing firewall. So if you had some custom routing options, you can add them here and create static routing. Now guest control. This is interesting because if you wanted to create as the uh, guest portal, guest network, that's actually an option on here so people can get on. And it will create this. Now this applies to the Wi-Fi rules. So you start with, I want to create a guest Wi-Fi or even a guest network. And I want people when they get on the network to have to log in. There's an entire module here and it's kind of cool. It actually gives you some editing options. So you can put what you want to have in here and you can edit this and it has a mobile preview, what it looks like on phone, what it looks like on desktop and what it will show them when they get on the network. And this is where you would upload or add your own terms and conditions to to determine that. Also, where you're going to set your guest network. So your guest network can be separate, and the default guest rules keep the network off of your other network. So if you create another Wi-Fi or you apply a LAN rule or a port rule or a separate VLAN for all of your guests, you can funnel all of it right here. And it's pretty straightforward to do. So we'll jump over here to wireless, create a new wireless network, advance, and we'll call it the guest. And then we check the box that says apply guest policies. And I'm just going to, you don't need to go in any of the advanced options, or nothing unless you have something more advanced you want to do. So we're just going to apply the guest policies. It's provisioning it. 
And this is back to where we finished setting all that. So we just created an open network. We're going to go ahead and enable the guest portal. Do you want no authentication, simple password, hotspot? Now, I have not tested this, and I'm going to do a separate video just to test this because I was told it's still a little buggy. Of course, it is in beta right now, but they have the uh, Facebook login. So one of the options is for guest options, you can force them to log into Facebook. i not as clear. Someone said it's not working well with the iPhone based on what I've written in forums. I will do my own testing with this at a separate video because it's a beta feature. It was just introduced in this version of the software, but... Once they put this in here, they're going to work on it, listen to feedback, and this feature is kind of up and coming. So we're going to enable guest. We're going to hit apply changes. Also, because of things like this, this is also why I mentioned a VM. You may not want something too slow as a VM because these are moving reasonably fast. But if you ran this on a Raspberry Pi as a back end, you want it doing uh, guest authentications. This all runs inside the VM module that is the Unify Controller software. And I will note, you don't need the Unify Controller software running 24-7 unless you want it gathering statistics and everything else. These, these machines, if the Unify system goes down or you're upgrading that particular virtual machine, it goes offline, Wi-Fi and everything still works. You just don't get to provision anything new and nothing changes and you're not collecting any stat statistics. Also, the guest portal runs inside of this, so the guest portal will go down, though, if the Unify controller software goes down. So I signed my phone into the guest network, and I, this is a quick screenshot I just grabbed from my phone, and it says sign into guest. So pretty straightforward there. And once again, we can look at my phone. We see the link labels. And we see it's connected to the guest network. All right. So you've given a big overview of all the settings and getting a Wi-Fi deployed and some of the changing a port, creating a VLAN, moving things to that VLAN, and how you deploy the Wi-Fi across multiple, including how we do a guest network. Now let's get into the insights because that's, of course, what's really important when you're trying to diagnose a larger network is what are the insights to things going on? So we go over here to Insights. And because we just did this, we're going to actually switch to something simple first before we cover what all this is. And we'll start with past guest authorizations. Now, we just loaded this right now in, for this whole video, so there's not a lot of data. But you get all these statistics and data inside of here that allow you to determine, like, you know, I can look at history of when guests logged in and when things started happening. So I'm going to close that out. Here's the guest. Here is me doing the authentication there that I'm online. So you can see which of the guests. But there's a lot of information in here. So this is really novel as well. This is the neighboring access points. And what the Wi-Fi units do is they look around and go, what's around me? And they see all the different Wi-Fi access points. This one's actually interesting. Derek Silverado. I'm guessing someone's vehicle has an access point in it, like a mobile one. <laughs> Uh, it sees different things that come by. So this can give you access information and statistical information about things it sees in the area. And it's grouping some of them together. Then you can also go here and pull down known clients. Here's some of the ones that are known on our network. And once again, you can filter this for different time periods. Past connections, things that were connected. Now, this is interesting to get a history of what was connected when. Uh, has all the date and timestamps in there. Switch statistics. And what's in there. Uh, this is really neat because you got the uh, information about what's going on in each switch port, a history of it, what was plugged into it. Uh, if you have PoE, we know these are PoE that we did in our test here, but those are options in there that so would give you the PoE information. It can give you the counters for statistics. And then we can say link status, only show me connected devices. So we can filter this real quick and make it a lot cleaner. And I, I like the way they do this because it's now giving me a lot of information and I can really start diagnosing the network and this is the beauty of the way Unify works. One dashboard consolidated, if I had two switches like I have here, or if I have 20 switches or 200 switches, I have all these different informational things I can do to start, you know, diagnosing and digging things. And here's, we didn't do anything. This is our pretend port, and this is the one we tested. So we've got eight packets that went through from that test that we did. And go back over here to known clients. Actually, to show you a little bit more data, let me jump over to, like, our network. So here's a look at like the stats for our network, and you can see, you know, 
uh, different connections and the amount of data going across, which is, of course, a whole lot bigger. And if we do things like uh, pass connections, there's a lot of information here. And then we can jump backwards for different time periods and show what was connected like for that. So we can drill down and see the different IP addresses that were assigned based on the different networks and, you know, trace things out. Also, uh, I have my network set up a little different because I don't have all Unify switches. So Unify does something a little bit different when you don't know when you have some dumb switches in between. So we're going to go to Maps. And I have only one Unify 8-port switch on our network and then some dumb switches, but they're VLAN off. So I'm using this to zoom in and out. Here's some of the Wi-Fi clients. But it thinks they're all connected directly to the... Obviously, you can't have this many devices on the 8 port, but switch. But port number 2 is connected to the dumb switch, so it sees all those devices, and it says they're all on port number 2. <laughs> now, my network is headed by PFSense, which means I have none of the deep packet inspection features you get with the USG at the head end. But what, but what it does do is it still has the switch tracking all the MAC addresses and the assignments through the switch and through the Wi-Fi unit uh, to understand where my phone's physically connected because it can see the MAC addresses that pass through the unit. So it's kind of clever uh, the way all this works. And yes, our, in case you're wondering, our Wi-Fi name for our business Wi-Fi is Notice Me Senpai. So we'll go ahead and close this out. And we'll finally take a look at the dashboard, what that shows us, and the deep pack and inspection system. Now, the deep packet inspection system, by default, is turned on. So we're going to actually jump back into here, deep packet inspection. And it allows you to create categories and restriction groups based on the categories and restriction groups they came up. For example, social networks. Enable restrictions. You can block everything on there. You can add, let me get a social network. People who bypass proxies. We're going to go ahead and hit save on both of these. Actually, we got, I forgot to check the block matching traffic. And we'll go ahead and log it. So we hit save. Now, this is where you can choose where that rule gets applied. So I want that rule applied to the guest network or the LAN network or the Wi-Fi network. So you can apply this rule to that. We're going to apply it to the LAN default. You can create more groups and get fine grain control and segment this out. So in theory, this should, and I haven't tested this and we're going to test it live here. Uh, once this is done provisioning, I should no longer be able to get to Facebook on here across this network. Provisioning. And here we are stuck. Establishing here secure connection. I can get to Google. Not that I ever use it, but I wonder if I can get to plus.google.com or if it restricts that. I guess they don't see Google Plus as a social network. <laughs> so I am online. And Facebook is timed out, so they have decided to block it. So when we take a look now, I can't get to Facebook, and I see Facebook's in red here, so I'm guessing that means it's uh, blocked. Um, I'm at the read a little more on the deep packet inspection. I haven't really used it much because we don't deploy a ton of USGs uh, out there, nor do we really get into the filtering like this. Like I said, mostly PF senses are head end. Sorry about that. Uh, last thing I guess I probably should have covered here is the events thing the events uh, list that are over here, so I call it a thing, the events list here. And this actually gives you some warnings, errors, and history of the events, uh, but it gives you all the events that occur so you can kind of track out the history of things. And you can it actually logs all the uh, different settings that were done, was adopted, provisionings, uh, when we add different things in here. So you actually get a nice history that's uh, searchable. And we can search, for example, of everything about the 48 port switch that was done. Errors with it, warnings, or back to just general. We'll click 
close that. I guess the last one other thing is the maintenance on it. Uh, these are fairly maintenance free, but you can do things like download the backups from here. So once you get it all configured and all set up, the backup is really straightforward to do. Download backup, not much to that. And uh, if you ever have to move this to another controller, you just go to restore or if something happens to this one, uh, choose file, restore, it restarts and everything just goes right back to normal. And it has some data retention because obviously you're not just backing up the system, you're actually backing up the data, the logs and everything else. So uh, there's some options in here to determine that part of it. All right, so hopefully this was helpful in getting you set up with Unify. And if, like I said, there's something you want me to cover, something more in detail, I'm overall really happy with the Unify devices. I think the USGs are getting a lot better, especially since the first time I reviewed them. But on the bigger side of it, they're not really in-depth in features. Like I said, that the firewall, it'll get you going, but the firewall rules aren't very advanced. And obviously it didn't even give me an error when I try to drop something on a network that doesn't exist. And not that that's necessarily a, a deal breaker at all, but it's something to keep in mind and it's something they could improve on. But overall, the system does work very well, and you can't beat the price point of these. You're, the USG, I mean, I'm knocking it a little bit, but you're also talking about a device that's only, you know, a little over $100 to purchase the basic USG model. So you get a lot of features for 100 bucks. that is for sure. Uh, the Wi-Fi and the switches, all working together with this software, outstanding being able to track your packets and figure out where everything's going and how everything's getting there and the auto drawing of the topology being able to trace out a device that's just i love that being able to map these out being able to see the connections over you know this map here so laying it out over a map of your building or being able to do the topology and have it drawn in real time to go okay this is my network connection that's some amazing stuff right there that's that's gold as far as I'm concerned. So as much as I'm mediocre on the USG, a lot of times um, we have a PFSense firewall because I love all the features and VPNs that come with PFSense. So that's often ahead of a network. But the rest of the network, we love deploying Unify because this system works. It works really well. It's really solid. Uh, but for, for the price point, I don't think you can really beat the USG. And if the client doesn't have a lot of crazy firewall configuration rules that you need to do, the USG works really good for uh, dropping it in and just needs to route traffic. It will do that excellent. So on that aspect of it, I think it's great. So hopefully this was helpful. If you like the content here, like and subscribe. If there's something uh, you want me to go in more in depth on, let me know. If it's the VPN, that's going to be a separate video. I don't know when I'll get that done. I want to. I got to get more than one USG in here, and I'm not the biggest fan of them, so I don't know when I'm going to do that. But if someone wants to mail me one, I'll, I'll definitely do it. I just don't know if I want to buy one right now. All right. Thanks for listening. If you like the content here, like and subscribe.